It's called How Millionaire Bankers Actually Work. And this, I thought, was fascinating insight into that whole world of, like, finance and shit. And for me, made me think, man, Jesus, man, I wasted so much money. I wasted so much time in that cool guy world when I could have actually gone into finance. And this is what I'm doing now. I'm doing it now at the moment. So I'm, I'm happy that I kind of made that change a long time ago. But I should have done it when I was still coming up. Because when I was coming up, I was trying to make it in the scene by working for brands that were within that scene with the understanding that, or with the hope that if I start off working here, I could go up. That never really happens. It's very rarely. You have to actually try to get up there in the first place. You have to try and apply there. But I had this weird way of thinking where I thought, oh, if you work on the Nike shop floor, if you work at Nike Town, if you work at 1948, if you work at all these cool streetwear stores, you might then get the opportunity to work in the head office. That is possible. Nothing is impossible, but it's way more possible for you to go get an education that gives you a good level of whatever, you know, qualification that could get you a job, entry job straight into the office without even working on the shop floor. That's what you should be doing. Or go the other route and just work for a random company, get your qualifications and then enter a bit, you know, maybe a mid-level at the cool guy company. That's what you should do really and truly. But what I'm doing now is just working a completely generic job that has nothing to do with the cool guy scene using whatever money i make from that and then investing it into stuff i do on my side projects and then hoping that over time the side projects take over the full-time job quit the full-time job do the side projects for full time and that's what people should that's what i think people should do but i'm also understand that if you're working in a creative field some people like I, I have the ability to like split my brain and do both things at the same time but some people don't and sometimes it can be quite stressful to keep those two things going, to be performing at a high level at your workplace and also putting all your time and effort from like, you know, let's say you work nine to six at work, then you're coming back home and you're doing your side project from seven to 12, five days a week, six days a week. That's a lot to do. Plus you have a family, plus you have friends, obligations. That's a lot to handle on someone's brain. So I can understand why some people would prefer to work a bullshit job, a shitty job that pays less, but requires less from you and then put that into your thing. But then unfortunately, like uh, Trivet said, you're living paycheck to paycheck. If your bike breaks down, if you lose your passport, <laughs> if you crash your car, you are fucked. You know, that's the only thing. When, the, when a financial emergency strikes you and you have a bullshit job or you have a shitty job, suddenly you start to realize, ah, oh, maybe I should have taken that good job after all, isn't it? Anyway, listen to this millionaire bank. Listen to this banker from the finance world talk about his experience. I think it's absolutely fascinating clip to play. Let's freaking go. It kind of makes you realise that they're the same people. When I started working, it was this kind of a bit of a mad environment. I'm always remembered of, always reminded of, you know, when you hear footballers talk about like. Footballers from like the 90s and the 2000s talking about when they came through and the stupid like hazing rituals and stuff. Like on my first week, they made me buy like a hundred burgers and carry them up and like give them around the trade for this kind of thing. But there was a lot of that kind of nonsense going on and there was a lot of people getting taken out to expensive restaurants and clubs and taken out to holidays. I got taken to Vegas when I was 21 before I, I went to Jay-Z's after party in LA. And then I went to Carmen Electra's birthday party. I hadn't even started working full time. Oh, yeah. And then one of the nights, oh, I can't even remember. It must have been like twenty or $30,000 one night in a Vegas club. To me, it was really weird because, you know, I come from a very poor background. And, like, I was in, in a VIP table in L.A. with a bunch of, like, 35-year-olds who were paying girls who looked just like the girls I used to hang out with at uni to hang out with them. You know what I mean? <laughs> My specific desk started to make enormous amounts of money which was like, it was really crazy for me. I was like super young and I, the, I, some of the guys I was working with like pretty crazy guys. And um, they started getting like really big for their boots. And one of the guys immediately got one of the, one of the secretaries pregnant. Like, oh, yeah, Like a week. <laughs> what it meant was the amount of money we were getting paid just for sitting in our seats went up a lot, which meant that you could afford to lose a lot of money without it appearing like you were losing a lot of money. So for example, if you're making a hundred grand a day, for the bank, just for sitting in your seat. You can afford to lose a hundred grand a day on bad bets and not actually be officially losing money. Obviously, I know now that there's like this massive stereotype that traders take cocaine. So I was expelled from school for selling three pounds worth of cannabis. There we go, it's what I want to hear 16. about. It's what I want to hear about. And um, I was like, that's it, no more drugs. I'm off drugs, no more drugs ever again. So I, I never, I've never taken cocaine in my life. And um, 
you know, I turn up in the in the place. Everyone's like going out partying until like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. and getting to work at 5 in the morning. And I was like, how the f do these guys do it? You know, they're older than me as well. But by my late 20s, some of my mates were taking cocaine. And they were doing that thing that people on cocaine do, where they talk like just at you mm. a lot really quickly. And they're being really boring, but they don't notice they're doing it. And then, of course, that is what my whole career had been like. And then I realised like, f me. Were those guys just on cocaine the whole time? And, I, and then since then, one of my colleagues who um, is very upset about the book came out and said like he spent, I think he said he was spending 80,000 pounds a year on cocaine. Yeah, which is, but the funniest thing is like, I had no idea it was happening. I had no idea it was happening. I just, I thought he was an alcoholic. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine making so much money, <laughs> making so much money that you're spending eighty thousand pounds a year on cocaine. Now, eighty thousand pounds of cocaine could mean any vice. Replace cocaine with beer, with food, whatever, whatever your vice is. Could you imagine spending that much amount of money on your vices? But I guess it makes sense because you know, usually, I think people always say like your habits don't really, you know, your basic your habits scale based on what you make. So whatever you make will, you know, so some, that's why you have to get your habits and addictions in check because when that big money comes in, you could go flipping crazy <laughs> pretty quickly. But I'd also imagine part of the job, you know, especially if you're working in the finance industry or if you're a broker, finance, whatever it may be, it's probably pretty stressful. So as much as that drug lifestyle, drinks, booze, women and all this sort of malarkey is fun, quote unquote, you're probably doing it to cope with the pressure. That's probably why, because I'd imagine, you know, from my short time working, um, I've sometimes been in quote unquote high pressure situations. And usually the more higher up you go, the more people that you meet who have real responsibility and they're, they're in charge of like big budgets and all that malarkey and they're real decision makers, real needle movers. They're the ones who usually have those kind of vices where they need to kind of like numb themselves or black out from time to time just to kind of deal with the stress that comes with their job on a daily basis. They need it. I, I've, I've not really seen a lot of people on the entry mid-level place kind of fucking around and taking the piss. It's usually the higher level people. But the higher level people are also the ones who for some reason are able to just like turn on and turn off they're able to like go out all night so like there's be times where like you go out with some some people in your office who are like super high level and they will be the ones who like be out later than you you'll go back home at four but then they'll go home at six but they'll still get in the office before you they'll still be in the office before you they'll sometimes look better than you like it's fucking weird it bugs you out you're like hold on i left you in the club how are you here before me and you look like you showered like <laughs> what but i guess that's part of the makeup of somebody that's a, a, able to perform at that level with or without drugs they're just like go 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 and they're usually these people even the ones that don't do anything they're usually the ones that come in at seven stay until eight nine p.m like wild shit bro wild shit Holic. Probably the mad maddest thing was, again, this guy Rupert, from a very rich background, but he he really took to me really quickly. And, you know, sometimes I feel bad about the way I portray him because um, he really was good to me. He really, like, sponsored my career, drove me through, and um, he would take me out, like, with all of his mates. And he lived in Clapham and I lived in Ilford, which is, like, totally opposite ends of London. And um, he'd take me out with all his Clapham mates and, like, we'd be going to f***ing Movida, which is a big, mm. expensive club. And, no like either. expensive restaurants. I know that and, place. You know, he'd normally let me go like around midnight because otherwise I'd miss the last train and he'd have to pay for a taxi. But he was like, no, stay. He kept me out later and later. In the end, I stayed around, ended up staying around his place. I woke up. I felt like <laughs> I went to the office. I just threw up. I, you know, I went in, I had to go to the bathroom, just threw up. Mm. And the boss sent me home. Next day I came in early and uh, the boss was like, oh, did, uh, did Rupert do that to you? And I just laughed, you know. Then when Rupert came in, the boss goes to him. Gary said, you did that to him. And I, I knew that he'd be furious, right? And at the time, he, he used to sit two seats to the left of me, but there was an empty seat between us. And I just thought, like, don't look at him, just don't look at him. But I could kind of <laughs> feel him like, burning into my cheek. And then I start to hear, like, at first, just kind of like a, like a gentle growling, like a growling in the back, like a... <sighs> like this, and then I just think... And just don't look at him, don't look at him. And it starts to get like louder. Like this growling gets like louder and louder. He's on the trading floor in front of everyone. I'm just thinking, 
after. I mean, then I hear like this bang, this big bang, right? And then I think like, you know, I better turn around now because like, what the f has he done? And he's, mm. we used to have like, all the computer stations were like behind these doors and he'd kick the door. So it like smashed into the brackets and he was just kicking like that. And he was turned around in his chair, like leaning over towards me, like that, like, like that. <laughs> like gnashing his teeth like a, like a dog at me and growling at me. <laughs> and I just looked at him and he did it for about, it must have been at least 10 seconds, just like growling, <laughs> gnashing his teeth at me in front of everyone. <laughs> I just looked back and then he just start, start, started the growling, started to just chill and then he just kept on with his work. And he never mentioned it again. <laughs> you got to love it, innit? it? I'm buying that guy's book instantly. I'm buying that guy's book instantly. His name is Gary Stevenson. He's the author of a book called Trading Game. And he did this cool little series. I think he's, on, he's been on Lad Bible Insider, giving an insight on the finance world.